So the topic of today's lecture is feature descriptors. Okay. So last time we talked all about different ways of detecting features. So what was a feature? A feature was basically a good place in an image that we could reliably find in another image of the same scene taken at a different time or from a different perspective. Okay. So feature descriptors. So as we'll talk about a lot in the next uh, couple chapters, you know, the whole point of finding features is to be able to make these correspondences between images of the same scene taken from different perspectives. Um, and so what that means is that if I have kind of, um, this is my scene, and this is my first view, here's my little camera, and this is my second view. So that means that if I have a 3D point out here, then when I project it back to these cameras, you know, what I'd like to be able to say is that I can reliably match this location in image one with this location in image two, okay? And for that to happen, what that means is that I need a way of describing the pixels that appear around that location in image one and location in image two in such a way that they can be directly measured and compared, right? So ideally, what I want is to say, okay, so if this is, you know, a feature in image one, and this is another feature in image two, what I want is some sort of a algorithm that takes some region of pixels around F and produces a descriptor, which I'm gonna call D for the moment. And I want that the descriptor that I create around F is, well, I should probably say approximately equal to the descriptor that I create around F prime, okay? And so a descriptor is really nothing more than a vector, a list of numbers, right? So we wanna figure out what is the best list of numbers that I should use, okay? So there are, you know, lots of easy and immediate choices, right? So the most obvious choice is, what if I was to just draw a little box of pixels around that feature location, right? So what I could do is I could just say, okay, so um, here's image one, here's image two. You know, if I just drew little boxes of pixels around the corresponding features, well, then I could just directly compare pixel to pixel the values of the colors in those two blocks, right? like sum of square distances, for example. So that may work okay when you're doing something where the two images are very similar. So for example, if I've got a video camera and I'm moving the camera through the scene and the images from the camera are only separated by a fraction of a second, like a 30th of a second in the video cameras, right? That means that you know there's not gonna be that much difference between image one and image two, and therefore a block around you know, the projection of one feature in image one is gonna be basically the same block in image two. So there's not gonna be a big deal with that square of pixels deforming or not being directly comparable. However, we're often interested in what's what I would call the, the wide baseline case. So what does wide baseline mean? So here, this distance here between the cameras is often called the baseline, right? And so when I say wide baseline, I mean cameras that are physically very separated, right? And so in that case, there are lots of situations where taking just the same block of pixels in image one and comparing it to the same size block of pixels in image two is not gonna work for me, right? So an easiest, one easy example is, let's suppose that one of these images is kind of significantly zoomed in compared to the other one, right? So if I have, you know, maybe I should actually draw this a little better. So say this is a guy And here's a zoomed in picture of the guy. So if I draw a block of pixels around this feature, say I picked up on this guy's eye as a feature, and even if I found the same place here in this image, if I drew the, the block of pixels at the same size, you can see that the two blocks of pixels contain substantially different information, right? And also, what would happen if these images were slightly rotated, right? So suppose that instead, I was actually looking at an image that was more like, you know, this. Again, even if I could find this pixel again, then not only am I at the wrong size, but I'm also at the wrong orientation, right? And so what we need is a way to kind of abstract out 
all of this confounding information about scale and orientation, right? So in some sense, the descriptor should be what we call invariant to this extra stuff, right? And so that's why we talk about, for example, SIFT, right? Those of you that know about SIFT, um, stands for Scale Invariant Feature Transform, right? And so the, the idea is that the SIFT descriptor is constructed in such a way that even if the images are at substantially different scales, I basically get the same descriptor if I'm looking at the same point in two different images. Okay, so does that make sense? That's the big picture, okay? So what I want to do today is basically kind of overview quickly the main ways that people are using descriptors, okay, that are, are constructing descriptors. So kind of from this picture, you can see that the first thing that I need to do is I need to make sure that I'm comparing apples to apples, right? I need to basically have a region around the feature location, both images, that contains the same apparent chunk of pixels, right? And so we talked last time about how we could use the normalized Laplacian to find kind of like the apparent scale of a feature, right? And that kind of thing is definitely going to help us. So last time we showed that, you know, I could find an algorithm that would say if I, if I landed on this guy's nose, you know, if I found that this was the apparent scale of the guy's head, if I put the feature here, then the normalized Laplacian would hopefully give me the apparent scale of that feature in the bigger zoomed image as that, right? And so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to use this detected kind of typical scale as a way to construct our feature descriptor, okay? We could say, okay, well, I'm just going to start comparing features inside the same circle, okay? Now, because circles are not so easy to work with compared to squares for the purposes of computer programming, typically what we do in computer programming is we try and draw a nice uh, square around the pixels that we want to compare, okay? And so to draw the square, right, we need to decide on what should the orientation of this feature be, right? Because a circle, you know, I can twirl the circle around and there's no, um, you know, there's no like upside to a circle necessarily, but for a square, I need to kind of say, okay, well, what is the top edge of the square, right? I need to say what side is up for this feature. And so for that, what we need to do is do compute what's called the dominant gradient orientation. Right, so in this case, what I'd like to be able to do is I'd like to say, okay, if I draw my picture of this guy again, I don't know why I landed on this guy as an example, but. Right, so what I'd like to be able to do is I'd like to be able to say, okay, here is the square of pixels I'm gonna use, and this is the up direction on the square. And then if I found the same feature here, hopefully I could find this square and call this the up direction. And this way, the two areas of pixels would be directly comparable. All I have to do is I have to rotate both, both of these guys to be kind of horizontal and vertical edges. And then I can kind of, if I were to resample the squares to be the same size, hopefully this one-to-one -one mapping between pixels in corresponding locations of the square would work out for me, okay? So this is not really that hard to do. Um, and so, let me just show you a picture about one way it's done. So here, for example, if you remember last time I had this example with this Japanese lantern. And so here is a location that's been detected on that lantern, okay? And the black circle indicates the, so the radius of that circle indicates the um, detected scale of that feature, okay? And so you can see this kind of makes sense in, in that this circle happens to be kind of like sitting nicely inside the triangle formed by this white region. And so now what I want to do is I want to find the gradients in a region around this feature, okay? And so what I've done here in, in picture B, maybe what I should do is first go back to my drawing. So, you know, what I want to do is I want to say, okay, this was kind of like a sketch of what that feature looked like. What I'm going to do is I'm going to look at some neighborhood of that feature, and I'm going to count up the directions of the gradient. So you can kind of imagine what I'm doing is I'm going to form a histogram of the directions of these arrows, right? It's kind of like saying, 
okay, all you pixels around this feature, tell me what direction you think the, you know, the gradient is, right? The gradient, again, points in the direction of greatest increase, right? And so what I could do is I could imagine, okay, well, there's a, you know, zero to two pi set of possibilities. And so for every pixel here that's in this region, I could say, okay, well, I am going to increment the bin by one unit for every pixel that I find that has a gradient that is of this angle, right? And so as I move along the pixels along this edge, I'm going to be, you know, popping ones into this aggregation of this histogram saying, okay, lots of people are voting for this as the orientation. And maybe I get, you know, a few here, and maybe I get a few here coming from the strong edges here. And, you know, inside, you know, regions like this where maybe there's no strong intensity change, you know, the gradient estimation there may not be very good. And so, again, I may get a bunch of kind of just noisy contributions here from bins that don't really matter, right? So we can refine this idea a little bit. So one idea is that um, why would I even bother counting pixels like this that are in some flat region, right? I know that their gradient estimates are going to be not very accurate. I know they don't play a big role in how the image looks. So what I could do is I could, instead of adding one for every pixel, I could weight the contribution of that pixel by how strong the gradient is. So it's like say, okay, for those of you guys that have really strong edges, I want to count you guys a lot more. For those of you guys that don't have strong edges, well, I'll take your opinion into account, but I don't really care that much about it, okay? And so that means that probably what's gonna happen in this case is that I'm gonna get you know a bunch of really strong contributions and then a bunch of very like weak contributions here. And in the same way, just as we talked about for the, um, the detectors, we can also kind of weight the contribution of a, of a pixel by how close it is to the center of the feature, right? So again, I care more about pixels that are really close to my center point than I do about pixels that are kind of within my, you know, summing up region but are far enough away, right? So basically what you imagine is that I've got like kind of a Gaussian profile around the feature point, and again, there's a weight that says, okay, you know, stuff that's closer to the center should get more weight, right? And so that's kind of what this picture says, is that here you can see what I've done is I've already kind of imposed the uh, kind of Gaussian weight here. So you can see that the, um, you know, uh, contributions of pixels out here are pretty small. Um, and actually, I think I left out one step, which is also that, you know, since we have the detected scale of the feature, what I could also do is I could kind of blur out the feature so that I'm really kind of only saying, okay, you know, if I think this feature is really important at this scale, then if I blur away with a Gaussian kernel that is proportional to the size of that scale, then the edges that remain after that point are really the edges that I care about. So kind of what I'm saying is I want the gradient orientation that's important at that scale, right? And so after I've taken these gradients and then I've formed them into this histogram, then you can see that this black bar is the one that stands out the most. And if I draw a box that has an orientation that corresponds to that black bar, you can see that the box I draw is basically lining up exactly with what I imagine is a good orientation for that feature, right? It's going kind of, you know, you can see it's aligned with the strong edge in this image, right? And so the idea is if I was to look at this image in a rotated and scaled way, if I applied the same algorithm, I would basically get the box having the same apparent you know, orientation as I moved it to the different image, right? And so here you can see also that I've made the box a little bit bigger than the original circle radius. And so one way to think about this is that, you know, if the original scale, so I mean, the, the idea is that the radius there is kind of like the intrinsic scale of the feature, but if I was to draw a circle that had radius two times that or three times that, that, that new radius would still be invariant, right? The idea being that if I just multiplied my detected scale by three, then if I multiply the detected scale by three in the other image, I'd still get the same apparent set of pixels, right? So what I've done is I've kind of grown the set of pixels that I want to include in my descriptor. So kind of what's going to happen is that I'm going to use the pixels inside this square to build up this vector of numbers that I'm going to use to describe the feature, okay? And so now what I've got is basically a box that encodes 
both the scale of the feature and the orientation of the feature. Okay. And hopefully if I see that same place in multiple images, I'm going to get a bunch of boxes that all have the apparent orientation and scale matching up. Um, okay, so I pause and ask, are there any questions about this process? Yeah? Just out of curiosity, do you have to actually take and find the maximum in this sort of uh, distribution chart, or is it something that you could do by calculating, let's say, the average of all the gradients in that, in that area, the weighted gradients? Do I have to take the maximum, or could I take a, like, a weighted average? Um, well, I mean, there are different ways to do it. I would say that it would be better to take a maximum, right? Because, you know, if I were to take the average of these numbers, I probably would not get this high peak here. Really what I want is, kind of what I want is like the mode of the distribution, right? Where are the orientations where this thing really peaks, right? I mean, what I could do is, I, I don't necessarily have to take this all. I could take multiple modes. Like, for example, say that there was, you know, you could, you could make an argument that the feature could also be kind of well described by a vector that's kind of perpendicular to this because there are strong edges going that way too. And so here I might say, okay, what I could do instead is take the local maxima of this of this distribution. So maybe I would pick also this bar here that sticks up above its neighbors sufficiently to be considered a possibility. So I, I might have a feature that has kind of multiple dominant orientations. But averaging is probably not a good idea because it will smear out the, the stuff that I really want to keep. Gotcha. Right. Other questions? Yeah. Does it make sense to use a circle instead of a box here? Well, you know, you could argue that it makes sense to use a circle instead of a box, but when it comes down to it, we, we're going to be comparing pixels in different regions, and it's kind of a pain to compare pixels in circle, circular regions rather than in box-like regions, right? So part of the reason I'm using a box is because SIFT uses a box, and I want to talk about what SIFT does. I mean, there are algorithms that use circular regions, and I'll talk about those a little bit later, um, but you can use either. I mean. In, in most cases, though, I still want to estimate the dominant orientation of the feature. So um, we'll talk about whether we use a circle or a square a little bit later, depending on the descriptor. Yeah. OK. So the other thing I should mention is that the last thing I do, so what I'm going to do is I'm basically going to, uh, for every feature, I'm going to now say, OK, I have found this feature here. And I've found that this is, this is a crappy picture. So I have found this feature here. I found this is its dominant orientation. And I made this box that is scaled according to its detected scale. And so now I'm going to take this guy and I'm going to basically resample this to be a constant size. So for any feature I detect, no matter how big or how small, I'm going to make it an n by n block of pixels just by kind of resampling it. So typically, you know, for whatever reason, the n in some of the literature you read is like 41 by 41, for example. It's not like this is some really well-defined number, but this is the magic number that you see some places. And then the other thing I'm going to do is, you know, I want these feature descriptors to be invariant to how bright or how dark the image is, right? So if I see, you know, the same feature at you know on a building across the way in daylight, and then I see it at twilight. I'd like to be able to make a descriptor that doesn't have this light to dark variation baked into it. I kind of like to abstract that out as well. So what I could do is I could say, okay, if my what I could do is I could take my new intensities inside the block, and I could make them by taking the old intensities, subtracting off the mean, and dividing by the standard deviation. Right. So this is basically to do kind of some crude um, illumination invariance. I'm putting this in quotes because, you know, really you don't have, like illumination is a very complicated thing that involves 3D geometry and so on, but really what I want to have is something where, you know, fundamentally there's like some sort of intensity scaling invariance, right? This, this, this will account for shifts and scales, linear shifts and scales and intensity. Okay. And so now what I have fundamentally is after I do feature detection, I've got image one and this generates for me a whole bunch of bless you, a whole bunch of features. And then I have image two and this also generates for me a whole bunch of features. And now before I talk about the actual method of computing the descriptor, 
let's just think about, okay, suppose that I generate some sort of a vector for each of these guys. Well, then how would I do the matching, right? Well, the most obvious thing to do is simply to say, okay, for each of these guys, I'm going to compare it one to one with every one of these guys, and I'm going to compute a metric for how good the match is, right? So for example, the most obvious thing to do would be something like, you know, if A is a, you know, if A is a feature in image one and B is a feature in image two, you know, what I could do is simply take for a given A, find the minimum B such that I minimize the Euclidean norm between these things, right? This is like saying, you know, I minimize the sum right? This is like the the length of that vector. Sometimes it's easier to not have the square root, so I could also just look at this. Right? I should get the, the same kind of thing, so why would I, you know, I don't have to do the square root. Another thing you could do that's a little bit more complicated is that you could look at kind of like the, what's called the Mahalanobis distance between the two vectors. So it's like saying what I would do is I would take A minus B transpose some sigma inverse A minus B. So this is called the Mahalanobis distance. And you'd use this if you have some reason to believe that different entries of the feature vector were kind of statistically correlated with each other in different ways, right? So for example, if you knew that the, the number in the first position was much more important than the number in the second position, then the two numbers in the diagonal of sigma would be very different. Or if you knew that features one and two kind of went along with each other in a certain way, then the, so yeah, I don't want to think about this too much, but basically if you had some sort of a model for if I saw lots and lots of feature descriptors and I wanted to look at how correlated they were element by element, I could build this Mahalanobis distance. So, you know, most of the time I think that we can safely assume that we're using something like this. You know, so this, this is basically just going to be like sum of square distances. Or sometimes you see it's called SSD. And this is really the Euclidean distance. or the L2 norm. And, you know, most of the time you can get away with something that just says basically for every feature, I find the best matching feature in the other image, and that creates what's called a correspondence, right? Now, one thing that, you know, makes that process a little more complicated is what happens if there are many similar features between the two images, right? So let's suppose that I have a, you know, a building with a bunch of windows. And again, I have a, another picture of the same building. Well, since I know that corner detection, since I know that corners are generally good features, that means that maybe I find this as my feature in image one, and you know, maybe I found all these features in image two, and actually all these guys locally look like pretty great matches to that feature, right? And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna find a whole bunch of features that have very low feature to feature matches, but yet I wouldn't really wanna trust any of them, right? And so what I would do here is I would only pick a feature if the distance, so let me just draw this like this. So this is like the best match, and this is the second best match. So the idea here is what I could do is I could say only accept the feature match if this number is acceptably low, right? What that means is that, you know, in the window case, the best match and the second best match are gonna have almost the same quality, right? Which means this number is gonna be close to one, right? Whereas for a really distinctive feature that I can't find anywhere else in the second image, then the best match is gonna be 
a lot lower than the second best match. And that means that that is a better candidate for there being a good feature. So what, what I might want to do is use what I would call this, they call this the nearest neighbor distance ratio. And the idea here is just to guard against these cases where an individual match may look good just looking at the, the lowest distance, but it may be a bad choice for going forward and assuming that that's a real correspondence. And then if you wanted to get fancier, you could do things like normalized cross-correlation, which we're not going to really talk about right now. Um, another thing I'm not going to mention right now yet is that there is a strong kind of geometrical constraint on where matching features could possibly be, right? So, I mean, if you think about it, you know, if I have a feature here, so let's suppose I have this feature and this feature, in the other image, it really kind of isn't geometrically possible for this feature to match over here and this feature to match over there, right? So there's some sort of a constraint that you feel like, you know, there can't be this arbitrary geometric location of where the matches can occur. And we're going to talk about that a lot in detail in section uh, chapter five, I'm sorry, chapter six, I guess. No, chapter five, about what's called the epipolar geometry. So basically epipolar geometry is a, is a kind of an encapsulation of the geometric constraints that govern where these matches can occur. And so if I wanted to, I could also weed out bad features by estimating the epipolar geometry. So we'll talk about that a lot more next week. Okay, so at this point, I think we can assume that basically we have generated a bunch, we've detected a bunch of features using the methods that we discussed last time. Now we have drawn these kind of scale and orientation invariant boxes around each feature. And now I have to decide how am I going to describe what's inside these boxes, okay? Um, and that's really what the heart of making a descriptor is all about, okay? And so, most descriptors are based on building histograms of pixels inside those boxes. And of these, the SIFT descriptor is really the one that you will come across the most often. And this is the one that is used pervasively in computer vision these days. So SIFT which stands for Scale Invariant Feature Transform. Invented by Lowe. So basically what I do is I take my feature that I've found. So let's see, again, I have kind of this setup where I have my detected feature. I turn that into my normalized feature over here. So again, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna divide up this box into 16 smaller boxes, basically a four by four grid. And then within each of these grids, fundamentally I'm gonna build a little histogram of gradient orientation. And so here, this is a very uh, crude histogram. This is really like, in typical implementations, this is like an eight bin orientation histogram. And so what that means is that I've got uh, 16 bins and I've got eight, I'm sorry, I've got 16 grid squares and I've got an eight bit histogram into every square. So I've got basically 128 dimensional descriptor. Now again, there's some more secret sauce to how this actually works in SIFT. One of them again is the idea behind, you know, not weighting every pixel equally, but instead kind of superimposing this Gaussian around the center pixel so that 
pixels that are closer to the outside of the grid square are weighted less than pixels that are really close to the middle of the grid square. Um, there's also a little bit of secret sauce in terms of, you know, if I've got a pixel that is really close to the edge of one of the grid squares, it doesn't necessarily make sense that this guy only contributes to this grid square because it's possible that if I drew this grid around a feature in a different image, that just by kind of you know errors in my estimation, that in the different image, this guy might contribute to this grid square instead. And so what you do is what's called trilinear interpolation, which basically says that you know when I've got a when I've got a pixel that is kind of close to the boundary of some other guys, then this should contribute a little bit to each of these other grids, right? If I'm really centered right in the middle of the grid square, well, then I can be pretty sure that I'm mostly contributing to that grid square. But as I get closer to the edge, I kind of contribute a little bit to both squares. I think I have a picture of this. So again, here's the picture of taking the original feature. So again, here is the detected scale and the orientation. Here I've made a box that is, I think this is basically six times the size of the detected scale. And here is my rotated box. And what you see here, this kind of white sticks inside each grid square is kind of like saying how much uh, it, how much is in each histogram been in the direction that is pointed to by the stick. And so you can kind of see that, for example, in this grid square, there are lots of gradients that are kind of going along this diagonal. And that's why this guy here is relatively large. And so you kind of see, you know, it's not perfect because you can see, you know, there are some big sticks that don't necessarily immediately correspond to for example, up and down lines. But you can see that's kind of the way to interpret it is that in general, you want the big sticks to be pointed along the uh, gradients of the image inside the box. And this picture isn't taking into account all the smoothing and stuff that has to happen. And this is kind of the picture I was showing you before. So basically, the idea is suppose I zoom in on a two by two uh, array of grid squares, I look at this point, and suppose that this point has this gradient orientation, right? And so what I would do is I would say, okay, well, this point should contribute a little bit to all four of its adjacent grids because it's kind of close to that corner, right? And since this angle, you know, the other thing is that since I'm doing this very coarse quantization of the gradients into these eight bins, again, just to be on the safe side, what I could do is I could say, well, what I'm going to do is for a for a, uh, an angle, an estimated gradient of a pixel that doesn't exactly fall into one of these bins, well, it should contribute a little bit to the two bins on either side. So really, every pixel is contributing a little bit to eight bins in the 128 dimensional SIF description. So again, the details of this are a little bit tedious, but this is kind of the way it works if you really get under the hood. Um, oops. And the last thing I want to say before I show you that picture is that, so now at the end of this, I have basically a, you know, what I can think of as 128 by one vector that represents the gradients in that image, right? Um, what I can do is, you know, to make sure that everything is uh, comparable, I normalize this to unit length. Right, just so that I don't have one vector that is much, much bigger in terms of values than the other vector. If I see any big spikes, you know, so say this is a really big number, you know, the way the SIF descriptor works is to zero this out and then normalize it again. The idea is to basically zero out things that might be noise from other pieces of the image. Now, you know, you could argue about why you do each of these little steps. I'm just kind of telling you how low proposed to do it, but you know. Suffice it to say that there have been a lot of uh, experiments about you know, how do you make this descriptor as robust as possible to scale and viewpoint changes. And so there are a bunch of little bits and pieces you have to do to keep track of exactly what Loeb proposed to do in his paper. Um, and so at the end of the day, how does the descriptor matching work? So here's an example of SIF descriptors detected for two images that 
um, I guess because I've drawn these, you know, um, you know, the left image is actually substantially lower resolution than the right image. You can see that, like, for example, the text at the bottom of this lantern is really blocky compared to the text over here. So actually, this image is quite a lot smaller in pixel size than this image. But what you, what you see here are descriptors that have been correctly, or not correctly, descriptors that have been automatically matched by this whole process, right? So basically, I've found the descriptors, and I've matched them using this nearest neighbor distance criterion, the one that basically makes sure that I don't have any possible duplicates. And you can see that what I get are pretty good correspondences, right? So you can see, for example, that you know this, this guy here has fundamentally the same detected scale and orientation as this guy over here, right? Even though the images were very different sizes. And you can see even here, there's a lot more detail inside this lantern than there appears to be over here, right? And so actually, most of these features are pretty good. Um, you know, there are a few that are not so great, like this guy here doesn't seem to match to anything over there. Um, you know, there's a couple extra guys, like there's this extra guy over here. But this is the point where we can say, okay, you know, actually 80% of these features are already pretty good. And we can use those as the basis for, for example, estimating the 3D transformation between these two images, right? And that's what we're going to do in the next couple chapters is use these correspondences to learn things about the geometric relationship between the cameras that took the images, okay? Um, and so one of the homework problems is basically to do a similar experiment, right? So take some, you know, build some sort of scene on your desk, you know, take a picture of it from one angle, take a picture of it from another angle, kind of zoom in a little bit, and then use the, you know, SIFT code that I provided in the homework to fundamentally try and match these two things and see how well it works, right? You're gonna probably see some stuff that resembles this, right? So it's not like the features that you get are gonna be like amazingly uh, intuitive, right? So you can see here that if you were to pick out good features to match between these two things, you'd be like, hey, well, why don't you pick out these edges of this lantern, right? I don't have an answer for you about why those don't get picked up by the SIF descriptor other than that they've been weeded out at some part of the process, either during the detection process or during the, the descriptor matching process. All that really matters is that you've got enough at the end of the day, you've got enough good features that do match, right? If you try and find reason in the SIF descriptors, you'll go crazy looking after you look at these images for a while. Okay, but that's the basic idea. So let me pause and ask if there are any questions about that. Do you think in the filtering they're just filtering out descriptors that are too similar to each other? So in the filter, so actually that's a good point. So it's, it's possible that there were good SIF feature descriptors here, and then the nearest neighbor distance criteria threw them out because it would be difficult to distinguish, for example, this corner from that corner, right? So that's a good point. I didn't actually show the features prior to the filtering process. Okay. So that, that may be a reason why they didn't get detected. That's a good point. Other comments or questions? Okay, so SIFT, when it came on the scene, totally kind of energized the community in terms of suddenly it seemed to become possible to take images of very different scenes. So, so again, SIFT is really only designed to be what we call scale and rotation invariant, right? Meaning that, you know, technically if I took images that were from a very different camera perspective, I wouldn't just have a scale invariance, I would also have this kind of perspective change, right? And there's nothing really built into SIFT that makes it automatically invariant its perspective change, but it did seem to actually work pretty well. And so suddenly people started to use SIFT all the time in terms of designing these machine vision algorithms. And so people are still using it, um, but there have been a lot of kind of incremental refinements since then. And so let me just mention a couple things. Um, so one has to do with, um, you know, changing the, so we can kind of abstract the whole SIFT idea to have to do with we're finding histograms over certain regions, right? And so in SIFT, the regions have to be happen to be these square boxes in the grid, right? But there's another um, school of thought. So one is called uh, GLOW, which stands for gradient localization or gradient location and orientation histogram. So GLOW, I can just show you a picture uses this set of grids instead. So this comes back to the question about 
couldn't you use circular regions instead of square regions? And so this is a case where, again, the feature location sits in the middle. And what I do is I aggregate gradients inside this ring in the middle. And then I have kind of sectors of the circle that kind of go out and out. And there's a question about you know how large the radius of the center circle is and how much, as you can see that the radius of this outer annulus is a little bit smaller than this guy. And that's a little bit smaller than this guy. So there's this kind of idea of using what they call a log polar grid, where you know this would be basically like saying I have 8 plus 8 plus 1 is 17 kind of regions. And then inside to these, I could quantize the histogram into they use 16 angles instead of 8 angles. right? So that turns into a different type of descriptor. right? Another possibility that people explored uh, was called DAISY. So this one, this is just an example where basically we, hit, we have the same kind of idea is that we are creating um, bigger and bigger regions of attraction as I kind of move away from the center. And then I've got kind of um, a choice about how many kind of um, petals, as it were, of the daisy do I use? You know, do I use eight or do I use 10 or whatever? How many rings do I use? You know, how far apart should the rings be? And so what people have done is kind of these exhaustive uh, algorithmic kind of experimental validation of saying, OK, well, as I tune all these parameters, what gives me the best descriptor matching performance? right? And so people have compared the SIF descriptor against the GLOW descriptor against the DAISY descriptor. And you know, some have been shown to work better for them. I mean, I think you'll find most people are still using SIF, but there has been a lot of work on kind of squeezing as much as you can out of the descriptor. right? And again, in this case, I think that for DAISY, you know, these are not like hard-edged circular bins. You can see the bins actually are overlapping compared to SIFT. And in this case, what's happening is that instead of just aggregating stuff inside the circle, there's actually a Gaussian you know, kind of kernel that goes inside to these circles and kind of you know, downweight stuff as you get closer to the edge of the circle. Um, so there have been a few other. Um, algorithms that are actually a little bit more related to 3D uh, feature detection and matching. So in chapter 8, we're going to talk about 3D stuff. And so there's been a couple of algorithms called spin images and shape contexts. So I'm going to save those until we talk about that stuff in the 3D section. Um, one thing that you'll see a lot is uh, called SIRF. So one, one problem with SIFT is that SIFT, as it is implemented, can be kind of slow, right? And the reason for that is that you've got a bunch of Gaussians to compute. You've got a bunch of uh, this, you know, you got this whole trilinear interpolation thing going on. And so, you know, initially when SIFT came out, it was not so immediately easy to implement this on a, say, you want to implement it on a mobile processor, right? So, I mean, that was not so great. And so, people looked for ways to make features that were faster. And so, one that you see commonly used is called SIRF. This stands for speeded up robust features. And so. Again, um, the idea was that I still use a grid, you know, the 4x4 four four grid. But instead of trying to compute all these gradient orientations, what I do instead is I compute very simple wavelet responses to the pixels inside this region. So wavelets, so basically, I don't want to go into all what wavelets are. Basically, what they used were Haar wavelets, which are really nothing more than like simple box filters. So really, applying these hard wavelets to the pixels inside this box is really easy, because all I'm doing is I'm just adding and subtracting pixels. And so that add and subtract stuff is much easier to do on a resource-constrained platform than it would be if I was doing all this kind of detailed gradient orientation stuff. Um, and so basically, the advantage of SURF is that it's extremely fast. And it actually has comparable performance to SIFT. And so you may see people using SIRF features in the literature. Um, you may also see PCA SIFT. So PCA SIFT is, I think, a little bit of a misnomer in the sense that you know, it's kind of reasonable to think about, OK, so the SIFT vector is always 128 dimensional. right? And so you might ask yourself, well, do I really always need all those 128 dimensions? Maybe I could get away with doing some sort of reduction in dimensionality of the size of the specter, that's actually not exactly what 
PCA SIF does. I mean, that's what I thought PCF, CC, PCA SIF did when I first heard about it. Well, actually, what they did was they looked at a whole bunch of um, basically they, they built a lot of detected feature patches, right? So they, they ran a DOG detector on lots and lots of natural images. They generated the feature patches. They learned then kind of what makes a good feature. And then they built a basis for projecting a given patch onto this, you know, space of all the good patches they had found. And in that way, you can kind of say, okay, I'm just basically projecting the patch that I've got for my feature onto this basis, and I can just choose the first, say, 20 or the first 30 coefficients projected onto this space, right? So that requires this kind of machine learning process that you need to get their basis from somewhere in order to use it for your thing. So anyway, I think that probably most of the time you're going to see uh, SIFT and SURF these days. Um, it's also true that, again, I don't want to get into this too much, but there are also what are called rotation invariants. And I'm only going to say this in passing because they're a little bit mathematically complicated. But the idea would be, you know, let's suppose I found this feature and I had drawn this scale invariant circle around it. So, you know, one thing that would be invariant to the rotation of this feature would just be, for example, you know, what if I was just to add up all the numbers inside the circle, right? That number would be the same no matter how I rotated the circle. Or if I added up all the gradients inside that circle, that would also be invariant, right? And so the idea would be that in theory, you know, I know that from kind of Taylor series, I could describe all the pixels in the circle as basically, you know, uh, what's happening here plus the second derivative, or I'm sorry, what's happening here plus the first derivative, the gradient plus the second derivative. And so as I kept on taking derivatives of all the pixels in this thing and adding them up, I could get these so-called invariants that in that case, I don't have to worry about estimating a dominant orientation of anything because I'm creating a descriptor that is inherently invariant to the rotation, right? There's no need to kind of have this initial step of estimating the rotation. But this part is a little bit, you know, complicated to do because the more and more derivatives I try and take, the noisier and noisier it gets. Um, so if you look in the book, you can see that there are lots of, um, th there are a few references to very detailed studies where people have said, okay, so, you know, what's a good descriptor and uh, detector pair? We're going to talk about that a little bit more next time. I guess I want to jump back and talk about a couple other things related to detection. So one thing is that, you know, let's think about this problem here. So, oh, question? Yeah. Is that kind of like a checksum for an application where basically, you know, if an application is exactly the same application, the checksum will be the same thing. So it's just kind of this really sort of fuzzy data math. On that yeah, side. I mean, there's a reason why you, you have low confidence on it or something. Huh. Well, taking it in two parts. So it's actually kind of a neat idea to think about this as kind of a checksum in some sense, right? I mean, um, although there's really not a sense of comparing two things. So, right. so. I, don't want to get, I guess I don't want to get into this guy too much because this is really mathematically complex. Um, what it comes down to is that there are some ways of taking the pixels that are inside this circle and creating numbers from them that will always be the same no matter how that circle is oriented, okay? But the number of such things that you can extract from that circle is not that big compared to the dimensionality of the SIF descriptor. And the difficulty of accurately extracting them so that when you do them in the same or in different images of the same scene, you know, the difficulty of getting good matches becomes higher, right? So that's kind of the, the main reason is that, you know, while it's true that, for example, if I was just to take like the, you know, average color inside the circle, yes, it's true that I could match that average color to somewhere else in a different image of the same scene, but that wouldn't be discriminative enough for me to really do good feature matching, right? I need to have more numbers that match up between those two circles to do better. And so part of it for me, I think, is the dimensionality of the vector that you can create 
and the quality of that descriptor, right? I realize that's super hand wavy, but that's yeah, no, that's the easiest way to do it. That's fair enough. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Other comments or questions? So I started to show this picture. So let's think about this issue though. So one kind of problem, and this comes down to the fact that, you know, basically what I've talked about so far is like scale and rotation invariance. What happens in this case where I have basically some sort of a serious perspective change, right? So even if I was to draw a box around the apparent size of this R in both of these pictures, you know, there's really no, uh, you know, scaling and resizing of this box that is going to make the contents of this square match up with the contents of that square. And the reason is that those images differ by this perspective change, right? And that's just not modeled by building a circle or a square around a region of pixels in the image, right? Well, what we would need to do in this case is build something that was more like a, uh, an ellipse, for example. And so here's a kind of a picture of what are called affine invariant regions, okay? And so the idea behind affine invariance is, okay, you know, I want to, in this case, instead of drawing a circle around a feature at its apparent scale, I want to find an ellipse, which are the yellow guys, that basically, as I were, if, if I were to, you know, look at these two different images, that the apparent information contained in the ellipses would be the same, okay? And so you can see that there are cases where, for example, um, the ellipse that I've gotten is much different than the circle I've gotten. And the ellipses kind of follow along with the dominant edges around the feature, right? So you can kind of see that when you've got kind of horizontal features, the ellipses kind of squeeze out to be more horizontal. And we've got vertical features, they squeeze out to be more vertical. And the apparent matching of the ellipses, you know, hopefully the same content is inside each of those ellipses. And so, um, again, I don't want to get into the mathematics too much. So basically, the reason the reason that we would do this is to um, these are needed for um, kind of high perspective distortion. Usually, when the images are taken from very wide baseline cameras that are very far apart, and so. Again, the philosophy here is that if I have an ellipse that is drawn, so let me just kind of say this. So what this means is that if this is basically a um, affine transformation, affine basically is not like a full perspective change, but something that's kind of like a rotation, a scale, and a shear. So kind of like a, you know, diagonal change. And this is an ellipse detected around the feature. Right, what this says is that if I were to apply an affine transformation to the image and find the ellipse around the corresponding feature, that that would be the same thing as taking the ellipse around the original feature and applying a transformation of that, right? That basically says that, you know, I get the same apparent stuff inside the ellipse. And there's an iterative procedure that you can use to get from these original circles that you got, which correspond to the apparent scale, to kind of turn them into these ellipses. And they go through this matrix that we used in the feature detection process, where we built this kind of uh, scale normalized Harris matrix. So it turns out that if you look at the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of that matrix, they kind of tell you how the gradients are pointed inside the region, right? And so the idea is that what I do is I kind of slowly kind of squeeze these uh, circles into these ellipses. And then once I'm done, I can kind of reverse the process to turn the ellipse so kind of what I've done here for this feature with the arrow is I've said, okay, I eventually found that this ellipse was this affine invariant region, 
and I turned it back into a circle, and if I compare the pixels inside the circle here to the pixels inside the circle here, they're basically exactly the same, right? And that means that now I could build a SIF descriptor or a glow descriptor or whatever I wanted to do on top of these circles, and I would feel good about it, right? And so if I really wanted one extra step of affine variance, what I would do would be this kind of what we call affine adaptation step before building the boxes for the descriptors. What I would do is I would first kind of figure out what was going on in the local neighborhood of the feature, and I would turn it into something where I would never worry about the distortion I might incur. And so, again, you can do that, and there's a lot of papers that compare these features, and so there's, for example, features that are called Harris affine features. That comes from basically running the Harris detector, finding the normalized, uh, using the uh, distinctive scale that we talked about last time, and then figuring out what the ellipse should be, and those are called Harris affines. They basically come along with not only a detected scale, but really this detected ellipse that comes along with the whole thing. It tells me what region of pixels I should be using. So again, this is a little bit advanced, but you know, it's, it probably is necessary for cases where the images that you're trying to match are really far apart, right? In that case, things like SIFT will start to break down. Okay. Um, so I guess I wanted to say just a couple more things about detectors that don't really necessarily fit into the kind of uh, taxonomy that I talked about uh, last time. So one is um, this guy. So this is a very simple idea. These are called fast corners. And the idea is that what I could do is I could say, okay, well, what makes a good feature, right? Let's step back and think about this for a second. So what makes a good feature is that it should be kind of cornery, right? And so the fast idea was, okay, here's a pixel here. I can build this ring of 16 pixels around it. And I can say, okay, so for this guy to qualify as a feature, for example, I want 12 of the 16 pixels to be either darker or lighter than the pixel in the middle, right? That, for example, that would mean that fundamentally there is this kind of dark corner surrounding this light chunk, right? And so that kind of idea is a very fast uh, test to apply to an image, right? So again, let's think back to last lecture. One of the problems with these feature detectors is that they can be computationally demanding, right? You've got all these Gaussians you have to convolve with the image, you have to do all this kind of multi-scale comparisons. This is like a very, very fast way to detect corners at scales. And so this is you know, something where you say, okay, you know, uh, and again, even better is I don't necessarily have to actually compare all these pixels. There have been uh, efforts to basically build what I would call like a huge decision tree where basically you say, okay, here I'm at this pixel, you know, now compare the pixel labeled one, now compare the pixel labeled 12, now compare the pixel labeled seven. So there's basically this whole kind of if then else comparisons. And then based on some historical machine learning about what makes good features, mm -hmm. you just basically have this whole hard baked in decision tree that you can quickly apply to the pixels around my center pixel to decide, am I a feature, yes or no, right? And so that test is extremely fast and um, that can help a lot when you're doing things like, for example, robot navigation, right? You don't have the time to do all this kind of fancy Gaussian convolution. You just want to find good feature corner points and you want to do it quickly. So um, that is, you know, not really related to any of the stuff we talked about last time, but still a reasonably competitive detector for some purposes. Um, another interesting idea is what are called maximally stable extremal regions, or MSERs. And so this is, I, this is an idea that, again, is fairly simple. The idea is, okay, let's suppose that I took this picture and I wanted to label all the pixels that were darker than some value, okay? And so, for example, maybe I start with that value being like 20, okay? And so here, if I compare this to this, this is basically finding all the really dark regions of the image, right? So, you know, here, for example, it picks up the spots on this fugu fish, but not all of them. It picks up, like, all the stuff that's in shadow gets turned to one. The lettering on the sign gets turned to one. Oops. And then 
Now suppose, okay, so this is like the everything less than 20 image. Now suppose I looked at the everything less than um, 125 image. So now, again, there's a lot of stuff that's white, if I go back to the original image, you know, so I'm still not picking up anything out here because this is all sunshine. But here, now I've got all the spots on the fish. I've got the letters on the fish. There's starting to be some sort of bleed because these pixels are all less than 125. And if I say all the pixels less than 200, for example, I've got even more of the image, right? So where is this going? Okay, so this is kind of related to an idea from image processing called the watershed transformation. And so the idea is the following. Let's suppose I just consider a pixel, you know, on this uh, character here, okay? So let me just go to my screen for a second. So these are maximally stable extremal regions. MSERs. Okay. So, kind of the way I think about this is, you know, not sure how easy this is to draw on paper which I guess is why I made a figure for it. So the idea is, okay, let's suppose I consider this point in the image, and this is a point that was, you know, uh, on a character. So I'm gonna make this an A instead of a Japanese character, okay? So the idea is that what I can do is I can plot how big was the island of kind of binary pixels that passed that threshold test as a function of threshold, okay? So what I could do, for example, is I could say, okay, you know, let's suppose that this um, A is of intensity 100, and this outside is of intensity 200, right? So that means this is like a dark A on a bright background, okay? And now I'm gonna ask myself, at this pixel, how many, you know, what's the number of pixels in the connected component surrounding this pixel that pass the test. And so as a function of threshold, you know, as I kind of go up to 100, right, all the pixels inside this A are basically, you know, nothing much happening. When I pass 100, suddenly all these pixels are, you know, included in the set. And then as I kind of go this way, since all these pixels are locally darker than their surroundings, nothing much happens until I get to 200. And then again, another increase because suddenly as I increase above 200, this A is gonna get kind of subsumed into a white chunk that contains the background, right? And so the idea is, you know, what I wanna do is I want to find the threshold in some sense. I want to find a place where as I, um, I just actually, this is kind of a crappy picture, but I need to introduce a notation to make this work. So here, this is basically the size of um, connected component containing pixel I. And so what I could do is I could make a measure that says, uh, let's see, actually maybe this is, all right, size of the component at threshold I. So what I could do is I could basically say, okay, you know, this number is strictly increasing, right? So the, the greater I make the threshold, you know, the more pixels will enter into that connected component, right? And so what I wanna do 
is I want to find what I would call a stable component, right? What that means is that, you know, um, as I increase the threshold, right, I don't want the size of that component to change very much, right? I want that, that change in size to be minimal, right? So if you can imagine what I want is, for example, I want a really dark blob on a really bright background so that even as I change the threshold, the size of that you know, connected component around that blob is always you know, fundamentally just the blob size, right? I'm not actually gathering in any more pixels. That means that that blob is pretty stable with respect to changing the threshold, right? So what this is a measure of is, you know, I want this number, I want this number to be small. I want this number to be minimal, right? So relative to how big I am now, I want the change in blob size to be small, right? Maybe easier to show with the pictures. So here, this is again, this is like the pixel inside the letter, right? And so again, the size of the component is very small until I get to fundamentally the color of the letter. Then it jumps up, and as I increase the uh, threshold some more, then basically I'm going to include more and more background. So you can kind of see, for example, here the letter is very well defined against the background. As I increase more, you know, what I could be doing is actually showing this as a more continuous thing. And if I had the image in MATLAB, I would show it to you, but I don't have it with me. So basically, now at this point, the connected component is huge, right? It includes all of this other white pixel crap. And so here, what I'm seeing is that there's this jump, and then you know, kind of it starts including more and more pixels. If I was to take this measure of kind of how quickly is the blob changing, what I get is a pixel is a picture like this that basically says, okay, you know, right around here is, you know, if I were to make the threshold this big or this big, the size is hardly changing, right? And so in some sense, this number here kind of tells me the sweet spot for, you know, where is this blob really the most stable? Right? I wouldn't want to choose this position right here because if I were just add one more pixel intensity, suddenly that blob would get suddenly a lot bigger. Right? I want to choose a region where changing the threshold a lot on either side is not going to make a big difference in how big the apparent blob is. And so if I were to choose the threshold corresponding to this number, I would get this kind of binary mask of these pixels are locally darker than their background and they're stable over a wide range of thresholds, right? In some sense, you can imagine what this does is it finds either light, back, light blobs on a dark background or dark blobs on a light background. And so, again, this is kind of good in the sense that, number one, it turns out that you can find these blobs very quickly using what's called the watershed transform from image processing. And so this has some computational benefits, which are nice. And then once you've got this, this set of blobs, I can basically draw like a bounding box around this blob, and then I could go forward and say, okay, now describe that bounding box with a SIF descriptor, or describe it with a DAISY descriptor, right? So in some sense, this is like an alternate to a difference of Gaussian detector for finding a good feature. This is something that is really customized towards, you know, blobs that stand out on a certain background. And so again, you know, I wouldn't characterize this as a, like, super commonly used feature detector, but is a competitive feature detector. And so if you look at the, you know, kind of benchmarking data sets, you'll always see this MSER as one of the things that people are comparing instead of DOG or, or whatnot. Okay. And so the main takeaway here is that you can really mix and match how you detect the features and how you describe the features, right? And a lot of times people have said, oh, you should definitely use the SIFT descriptor, but you should actually be using the Hessian affine detector, right? You know, for example, like there's no law that says that you have to use both the SIFT mandated detector and the SIFT mandated descriptor, right? You're free to change them around. Okay, and so next time, which I think will be a relatively short lecture, we'll talk about um, you know feature detector evaluation. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how do you introduce features into a scene. So when you have the freedom to actually place features into the scene, how should you do them in such a way that is as distinctive as possible? And then just talk a little about how feature detection is being used in computer vision uh, today. So that's kind of where we're going. Any 
comments or questions about this? Okay, so let me stop my recording and then I'll hand back the homework. I always fail at closing this recording. <laughs>